I was motivated to present this paper in response to questions I received regarding my player piano renditions. How do they seem to conjure a human playing a piano and not a machine? This question suggests a commonly held belief that foot pumping a player piano results in a mechanical, non-inflected succession of notes and rhythms. But this perception of the player piano runs counter to the actual development of the instrument encompassing the period roughly from 1900 to 1930. Despite the fact that the majority of early piano rolls were sourced directly from printed sheet music and metronomically quantized as perforated into the paper piano roll, player piano design itself allowed for molding a personalized and expressive performance. Player pianos at all price points featured hand controls capable of temporal and dynamic variation that the player pianist or pianolist could manipulate according to personal taste as they foot pumped. Added humanized expressivity required the expertise of what came to be known as the pianolist. A pianolist is simply the person foot pumping a piano roll through the me mechanism of a player piano. The term was coined in 1907 by an American writer, Gustave Kobe, and entered common parlance. Kobe derived pianolist from a previous term, pianola, commonly used to describe a player piano. From its earliest manufacture, the foot pump player piano or pianola under control of the pianolist in the act of pianolizing was capable of executing the essential components of expressive performance, namely the ability to vary dynamics and tempo. Since the player piano is a pneumatic mechanism, the pianolist foot pumping was actually referred to as blowing. Like any wind player, the pianolist could vary their blowing to facilitate dynamic variation. Blowing then was the basis for expressive pianolizing, but typical player piano instruments, even before 1900, also featured levers or buttons that stalled in it that could A, control roll speed and hence tempo fluctuation, B, subdue either the bass or the treble and or the treble in order to balance melody against the background and C, activate the sustain pedal. Quantize rolls often included a line of perforations that could automatically trigger the sustain pedal, but a pianolist could deactivate this set and directly control the sustain pedal via lever or button. Piano rolls were often inscribed by a continuous printed wavy line or a series of dots or stars. The line was conceived by the roll editor and inked onto the rolls in the manufacturing process. Called the expression line, it was meant to suggest to the pianolists suitable dynamic shifts for the selection. By marshalling their foot pumping skills and manipulating the manual controls, a pianolist could observe and follow the expression line, left, soft to right, as it went along, over the tracker bar. Expression lines were considered an elective guide from which the pianolist was free to depart. Additional functions were soon built into pianola design that offered expressive possibilities beyond those I'm mentioning. While these new capabilities may have made for a generally more expressive performance on the part of the average pianolist, they seeded interpreted interpretive decisions away from the pianolist to the machine. Two significant new capabilities were added, so-called theming and the meta style. Theming consisted of an additional set of roll perforations called snake bites cut into either side, left or right, of the paper adjacent to specific pitches of the roll's note on, note off data. Snake bite perforations so placed automatically triggered these individual notes to sound louder than the surrounding pitches. Theming mimicked a normal practice of hand played pianism, namely that of bringing out the melody. Thematized roles eliminated the need for a pianolist to make their own decision about which notes to bring out. It was predetermined by the role editor and executed automatically 
by the machine. The Metra style was a metal pointer that connected to the mechanism controlling roll speed as it traveled over the tracker bar. The pianolist could position the Metra style pointer over a wavy Metra style line on the right hand side of the piano roll. As the roll unfurled, the pianolist could trace the Metra style line with the metal pointer, effecting in this manner tempo modification pre-formulated by the roll editor. The piano roll companies soon developed the ability to record real pianists in real time onto a paper roll stencil. Not quantized, these were called play-by or artist rolls. However, play-by or artist rolls could actually be more difficult to render than those that were quantized. In MIDI, we have come to literally see the extent to which hand playing has wildly varied note timings and note velocities that nevertheless come together and project a coherent sense of flow and shape. But if in MIDI all the minute dynamics captured in the note field of a hand played rendition are not preserved, the rendition can sound jerky and inhuman. Even a skilled pianolist could not completely realize the welter of these exceedingly small scale dynamic variations. In any event, with the rise of metra style thematist players and their accompanying roles, the pianola's function morphed to that of skilled replicator of a rendition by somebody else. Social and cultural factors generated a demand for player piano tutorials that were met mainly by UK writers and also to a lesser extent by US writers. Both countries were then going through a period of intense musical nationalization that stressed musical literacy, literacy and music appreciation. In this climate, the player piano was seen to offer great benefits since the medium allowed for distributing high status piano repertoire and orchestral arrangements coming from the Western, mainly European canon on a scale previously unknown. Further, by eliminating the time-consuming drudgery of acquiring hand-played mastery of the piano and score reading, the machine was thought to accelerate the process toward an end goal of personalized music expression. On the other hand, the player piano provoked virulent controversy. Many feared the threat posed by a soulless mechanical device that could replace hand-played human performance. Countering that view, a certain breed of primarily British writers took the time to become familiar with the pianolo's actual performance potential. They developed extensive experience as pianolists and came to regard the pianola as a legitimate instrument with its own specific characteristics, but which, like any other instrument, required human intervention for expressive music making. One of the earliest to recognize that the player piano could be viewed positively in this way was the U.S. writer Gustav Kolbe. His 1907 The Pianolist, A Guide for Pianola Players was issued both in London and New York. Kolbe, 1857 to 1918, is best known for his guide, The Complete Opera Book. Kobe's spirited defense of the pianola is flavored by the American optimism of the day. Kobe aimed his remarks at an egalitarian audience of potential player piano purchasers. He praises the educational value of access to a broad range of repertoire via piano rolls being churned out by competing role companies. The heart of his promotion is the role of the individual pianolist at the creative center. He portrays a, a player piano as a way of leaping over the physical drudgery of learning to hand play the piano without relinquishing the notion that it freed everyone irrespective of formal music instruction to craft their own personalized role rendition without fear of judgment. This is possibly explained due to the expressive capabilities being built into the player piano design. The UK authors are a bit less egalitarian. The Player Piano Review, a monthly UK publication was active from 1912 to 1914 and is a primary print or a source for ideas about expressive pianola performance. The most important editors and contributors were Harry Ellington, 
Ellingham, sorry, <laughs> founder and first editor. Ernest Newman, su who succeed Ellingham as editor and as, as was an important UK critic and musicologist, and Sidney Grew. Each wrote books, articles, and reviews on a variety of other musical topics. Their writings in the Player Piano Review became a springboard for expanded tracks they published after the demise of the journal. By 1912, player piano technology had increased in complexity, culminating in the costly reproducing piano that could automatically reproduce a facsimile of a specific pianist's note on, note off data, as well as their dynamic variation. When electrification became a worldwide norm, reproducing pianos came to be installed with electric motors to supply the necessary airflow. At this final stage of the development of the player piano, interactive human involvement, i.e. where the pianolists control the expression, was obliterated. Harry Ellingham's 1922 How to Use a Player Piano ranges from the po proper posture required at the pianola to a description of how piano rolls were made through a history of the evolution of the player piano and its maintenance. His clear prose and intelligent observations give Ellingham's book a continuing relevance. Ellingham surveys the various expression levers and buttons and their use, but centers his discussion on the foundational importance of artistic foot pedaling. Quote, what controlled breathing is to singing, so is pedaling to good playing. Let your aim be to reproduce a melody that is phrased like a singer. Close quote. Ellingham shies away from specific interpretive advice regarding accents, tempo modification, and dynamic inflection. He observed, quote, the person with no musical knowledge asks, how can I know what notes to accent? There is no golden rule, close quote. Ellingham was not pleased with the trend toward automated expression, observing, quote, what then is the difference between the hand played and the ordinary role, ordinary meaning quantized? The ordinary role leaves one free to make his own variations. The hand played role has cut into itself all the ideas of the pianist. A colli collision of wills or a jumble of ideas is the result. Ernst Newman's 1920 publication, The Player Piano and Its Music Reflects, that writer's emotionally driven and idiosyncratic viewpoint. Newman, 1868 to 1959, does not describe the player piano's technology or the nature of the installed expression devices. He appears to assume that the reader knows all about them and understands their usage. He often comes at the subject from a confrontational, judgmental, and negative point of view. For instance, he says, quote, the main reason for the badness of the average piano player performance is simply that the performer has never been taught how to play. It is assumed that all one has to do is put on the roll and grind away. Despite the hortatory tone, Newman offers some excellent observations about the manner in which 19th century expressive performance practice can be attained on the player piano by the pianolist. He is especially strong in his description of the way accentuation can be achieved on the player piano. Quote, there is a way of securing phrase demarcation by an infinitesimal pause between the end of one phrase and the beginning of the next. Another device is there for giving vitality to one's phrasing, what is called the agogic accent, which consists in the slightest possible prolongation of the first note of a phrase. And he goes on. Newman recognized the importance of manipulating the sustain pedal for enhancement of tone quality and linear flow. He decries the inaccuracy of roll editors in their placement of sustain pedal perforations, which naturally leads Newman to recommend that the sustain be manually controlled by the pianolist. Sidney Charles Grew, 1879 to 1946, wrote The Art of the Player Piano, perhaps the longest, most detailed book ever to have been written on expression in the player piano. Dated 1922, it runs to 313 pages. It is curious that so little biographical information about him is available. 
The reason may be that his work fell into irrelevance due to its flowery, involuted prose style, at verbosity, and idiosyncratic terminologies. Nonetheless, Grude generated accurate and detailed musical observations regarding the nature of the player piano itself and how to play it expressively. His work is reminiscent of that of several piano performance theorists who wrote during the 19th century, both in the degree of Grude's detail and in the difficulty posed for a modern reader attempting to parse his ideas. It is clear that Grude was a very experienced pianolist. Grew had a full grasp of the performance implications embodied in the technical design of the player piano and, like Ellingham and Newman, stressed the centrality of foot pedaling and the artful use of the sustained pedal. The bulk of Grew's book, however, is devoted to several dozen graded piano roll selections. These serve as exercises for the budding pianolist to learn how to apply the author's expressive performance method as applied specifically to each selection. Grew's method was based upon an elaborate music analogy to poetic scansion. Grew may have seen poetic scansion as a way to convey his principles of musical expression to those without musical training. There are, of course, analogies between poetic scansion and musical expression, but the degree to which Grew expanded this approach and the florid manner of his prose lead to hundreds of pages of instructions that I doubt any person has ever completely assimilated, let alone implemented. Still, there are many worthy practical principles for expressive player performance contained in Grew's method that a resourceful scholar could consolidate and present clearly to modern readers. Reginald Reynolds, 1877 to 1958's writings were collected, including his 1927 tutorial, Playing the Pianola and the Duo Art, Pianola Piano, and published in the Amica Bulletin uh, of March 1999, entitled The Paderewski of the Piano. Trained at the Royal College of Music and the Guildhall School of Music, Reynolds began as a gigging musician before moving into the player piano piano roll industry. There, he became a major operative from marketing to concert appearances as a pianolist to editing roles for manufacture to participating in recording sessions with important pianists. He was also one of the role editors responsible for generating the expression and metro style lines printed on piano rolls but was actually ambivalent about their efficacy. Reynolds gives perhaps the most helpful description of the art of foot pumping, which I'll excerpt just brief sections. Quote, each foot, mu each foot must be trained to act independently of the other in somewhat the same way as a pianist's hands are trained, but with this difference that for pianola playing, one foot should be practically exclusively prepared for melody playing, accentuation, and phrasing, the other foot serving as an auxiliary. Although this different action of the two feet will almost always be desirable, it may sometimes be found convenient to use both feet equally." Close quote. William Braid White, 1878 to 1958, wrote possibly the most technically detailed American tutorial devoted to player piano performance. White's book, The Player Pianist, A Guide to the Appreciation and Interpretation of Music Through the Medium of the Player Piano, running to 170 pages, was published in 1910, both in New York and London. A highly regarded piano tuner technician restorer, White provides advice for expressive performance echoing that of his contemporary US, UK writers. He stresses the centrality of pedal technique, the refined use of the sustained pedal, the articulation of musical structure corresponding to singing and poetic scansion, and a preference for the interpretive freedom afforded by the earlier quantized roles. He observes that, quote, even when a role is cut with mathematically exact relations between the various time values written in the score, one would still need to enliven and vitalize the, mechan the mechanical exactness of the arrangement according to one's individual conception. Conclusion. 
The pianola and the amateur pianolists represent the last gasp of amateur home music making centering on the piano. During the period these tutorials were written, automated music produced by the gramophone and radio were becoming the manner in which most people consume music. Nevertheless, these long forgotten tomes retain significance because first, they document the history of the player piano from the viewpoint of musician writers who were on the ground as the technology was being developed and marketed. Two, the authors are in remarkable agreement that the player piano was indeed capable, even from its earliest days, of producing human-initiated expressive nuance. They describe the specific expressive capabilities commonly built into the design and how they could be used. Third, the authors unanimously make clear an unquestioning acceptance of interpretive concepts coming from 19th century performance practice. The design designers and manufacturers of the player piano and its accompanying roles shared the same premise. They built their instruments in such a way as to take into account the necessity for expressivity in music performance.